You are watching Tom Green's Webovision show. My name is Mike Hickey. I'm sitting in for Tom while he is uh, out on the road doing his thing. And um, today, <clears throat> I've got an amazing guest for you. Uh, it's somebody who has, um, well, it's a major deal for me anyways. I got uh, comedian and now actor Greg Turkington here with it's your dream guest. It's it's a dream guest, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of huge, and it's also kind of overwhelming because there's so much to talk about. That it's nice it, to finally meet you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot to cover, but uh, all right. So I guess everyone out there knows you for your Neil Hamburger character, or uh, I would say not everyone out there. Well, I, I think you're mostly well known for Neil Hamburger okay. and for Greg Turkington of On Cinema, uh, that smash hit series with Tim Heidecker and mm -hmm. Decker. You mm -hmm. know, th these are things that are like really huge right now. They're just happening. Your brand new movie Entertainment just came out uh, like this month to rave reviews everywhere. The New York Times, it was what, a critic's pick? Now I know why people like being on guests on your show. <laughs> Wow, it just all sounds so great. No, I mean, it is great. I mean, things are happening. Like, there's so much happening. Now, I think that a lot of people, I don't know if they know it or not, but you have been doing this kind of thing for, I mean, since you were a teenager. You've had your hand in a million different projects, and um, I actually want to talk a lot about those today, too. But my first official question that yes. I thought up yes. <laughs> is, um, so... Through your career as you know Neil Hamburger and as the singer of Zip Code Rapists, a lot of um, what's interesting about it to me has been the mystery behind it and the not knowing. Like you've never really spoken about a lot of things, uh, you know, out of character. And now that entertainment is out, you kind of have to. It's kind of like you, you, you know, you're. Yeah. So this, I, I never thought that this interview would happen where I'm talking to the real you. So I, I actually want to ask, how has it been? For, how has it felt for you, sort of going out and talking as yourself? How, like, how does it feel? Not good. <laughs> Not good. Really? I, I was saying to somebody the other day, it feels to me like, mm -hmm. if you, um, had a job, and you'd been there for years and didn't really like your boss. And then you went to the Christmas party and drank too much and had sex with him. <laughs> and then the next morning went home and then had to come to work the next day. That's kind of how it feels to really? me when I, when I see any of these interviews or, or anything. 
I feel like, oh no, what did I do? Like I put a lampshade over my head or something. Really? Like bananas. You mean just when you read them or? Well, I, I've only read a couple because I, if I read, I can't, yeah, it's bad. Really? It's, it's, well, I just don't, I mean, I've been in the car with you. We've driven, we've probably driven 10 times around the world if you were to add up the miles. I'm sure we have, yeah. Or maybe if you were to put a track from Earth to the moon, we might have been able to uh, complete that drive <laughs> with the amount of touring that we've done together. So I've certainly talked about all these things, but yeah. just going on record when uh, I always had been so resistant to it for a number of reasons, Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not the best. Well, that's, that's what's It's fine when I'm talking about yeah. it, but then it's just afterwards, I'm just like, why did I do that? But I have no, I have a gun to my head. Really? 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 No, I mean, not really. I mean, but no, but do you think it's like hurting something? I mean, it could be helping something, but it's just, it's just not what I had in mind. No, I know. I, I just know. like, I just like, you know, that there were a few questions unanswered out there, that there was information that people felt that they were entitled to that mm. they would never get, you know? Right. And now they're getting it all. Yeah, they're getting a lot of it. They're going to get it all today. Oh no, boy. no, but you know, I've, Here we I, go. I've been wondering that, you know, just watching like all of the press and just the way entertainment's received and just people really, you know, sort of, I don't know, they're just getting, getting into it and you are actually kind of coming clean and blowing the whistle. So it's, it's been well, interesting to see. You know, Tim gave me the best advice with this. Just don't think about it. And so I just go in and do the interviews and I'll answer anything that anyone asks, which is the complete opposite of what I've done, yeah. of being evasive and difficult for so many years. So in a way, it's kind of um, relaxing to actually do them. Yeah. You know? yeah like cool. I don't want to prepare and come in with all like, finally, I've got the perfect answer for these questions that mm. you've had. You know, It's kind of better just to go in and see what happens. Right. Well, um, I know never, that- And then never read or watch any of it. <laughs> I mean, going, for me now, going way, 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 way back, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna let our viewers know. Back in, I think it was 1993, I walked into a record store and I bought this, this record right here, or this one, whichever, however we wanna show it. You bought both of them because there was actually this a colored heads. vinyl and a black vinyl version. Really? Yeah. Okay. So this Faxed Head record was the first Greg Turkington record that I ever bought uh, before I knew who Greg Turkington was. And it is completely um, strange and confusing. It's, it's uh, a, a, one of your many conceptual metal bands. And because of the label it was on Amarillo Records, I went back out two days later and I bought this, not even knowing that you were the same, that it was the same guy that was in both bands, the same singer. And this was just as confusing, if not more so record. Um, uh, I mean, again, the, the, the mystery behind these records is, um, I mean, that to me was a huge part of the appeal of it, you know? Because when I listened to the Zip Code Rapist record, The Three Doctors and Other Sounds of Today, the main question on your mind would be kind of like, who would put this out and, and why? Like, because it's, it's, in fact, just to bring people up to speed. Uh, it's horrible like, music. It, it's not that it's horrible music, it's just that Although it's not, it is. It's, it, some of it is. It's not the kind of thing you would normally imagine on a record. And um, <laughs> I can't play you the record here, but what I can do is I'm going to play you a, a little clip. Can you play the ZCR montage, Mike? So the reason that I wanted to show that clip was just to, to show our audience that, uh, you know, you've been doing confrontational, you know, uh, unusual, you know, <laughs> types of performance for a long 
fucking time. Mm. And um, like when you watch that, like you've probably never seen that footage before. Do you remember that? That was at CBGB's in New York, right? Someone threw a table at you? Yeah, and all these cockroaches, um, the table hit the floor and it cracked the floorboard and then it seemed like dozens of cockroaches came out all over the stage. Okay. I mean, and those were heavy tables. Those I mean, were heavy tables. When that hit the stage, you could hear the thump. I mean, yeah. luckily it didn't hit you guys. But so did you, did you guys get a lot of like fights with the audience? I mean, doing the kind of thing you well, were doing. Well, I think we thought that the whole thing was a, like almost a parody of punk violence. Oh, okay. except that the, Except that then it actually was violent. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, this is a funny parody of punk violence. I'll throw this bottle out towards the crowd and then it breaks and somebody gets cut and then it's not really a did, parody. Did that actually happen? Yeah, that actually happened. Oh my God. And you, you threw like some cardboard out at and Cardboard, yeah. I mean, we would throw the most dangerous substances known to mankind. So the Zip Code Rapists, that was like a San Francisco based band that had out several <coughs> singles. You guys played around a lot, right? We played around a lot in San Francisco and then we played in uh, New York sometimes in Japan. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, Seattle, Vancouver, but we never did like a national tour. No, but you, you were very active in the early 90s. We were active, and yeah, those, yeah. Those records for me, man, when I, I mean, the records are a little different. They're like studio, like they're studio stuff, a lot of studio mm -hmm. stuff, so you could play with the sounds. And then there were a lot of live, just crazy, crazy, like the video that we just saw. And uh, we'd like to do like conceptual shows where we'd show up with a like a songbook of great American songs, and then do, you know, Stars and Stripes Forever, Old Folks at Home. Just just go through the songbook, and that was the show, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And then break a lot of things. There are always, like, enormous stuffed animals on stage, and trophies, and really always would wear ugly clothing, and yeah. a no. lot of drinking. Honestly, there was always a lot of drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did, <coughs> did you get, like, did you ever get so drunk at a show that, like, you did things that you actually yes. regretted? Yes, we did a show in New York, and the the crowd was so excited and so friendly, and they I don't know if I bellowed out for this or if they just uh, took it upon themselves to do this, but they lined the edge of the stage up with drinks that they bought for me. I mean, there must have been 20 drinks, you know, that people just kept bringing and setting there, and I remember maybe four songs in that I was going blind. Really? And then, and then I was like, I was not standing up anymore. I was like kind of singing on the floor. And then the last thing I remember is taking my arm and just going all along and knocking all of the 20 free drinks that were left onto the floor Thank where God. the glass all broke. And then, and then, you know, afterwards I remember every being, everybody being mad at me for, for putting on a horrible show. <laughs> you know? Well, it's, it's so, you she know. didn't drink the 20 shots because you'd probably be dead now. It's true. So, but it wasn't really, it was, I mean, that is just excess. That's just wretched excess. But I think in our minds, it was always a parody of wretched excess, you know? Mm -hmm. It was always a commentary on this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, but, you know, if you really are drinking that much that you're, you're, you're going blind, you have tunnel vision and are just smashing everything in sight, then, you know, is it really just commentary? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> hey, Mike. Just so we can let the audience know that the Zip Code Rapists also had some kind of beautiful moments, uh, could you play the next The Happy Like Larry video? Taken a long time for me to see the death is not bad like I thought it would be. It's the best part of God's plan. He takes us to his land. Don't you wish that you? Could be in the presence of God eternally. Don't 
Don't you wish that you were happy like Larry? is Christ, but to die is gain. We shall not fear, we are not slain. It's what we waited for. We walk right through the door. So yeah. Zip Code Rapists, Happy Like Larry, with John Singer on guitar and Danny Heifetz from Mr. Bungle and Dieselhead on drums. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, but the uh, interesting thing about that video, we actually made that video back in 1992. It was one of the first uh, videos to go into rotation on VH1 when the network first started. I know, and luckily we got permission to use it for this episode. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, so the Zip Code Rapists was on Amarillo Records, which is, I mean, that is um, a label that you owned and, you know, created. And that's kind of how I sort of got into you. Like the Amarillo, wh when I got into the Amarillo thing, it was, for me, it was like a light bulb, like mm -hmm. a real went off, like everything changed for me. It just was like, this is fucking amazing. Like th these records, they didn't make logical sense, you know what I mean? They were funny, no, they did but not. I, I didn't know why they were funny, and that's what was so amazing about it. And, uh, I mean, do you, could you talk about Amarillo? Like, how did you... Was this the first Amarillo release? That was, yeah. So this was the first Amarillo <coughs> record release. Yeah, it was. And, and I assume that, like, part of the influence on the label was your, like, your private press record collection and stuff. Yeah, I mean, that was part of it. I mean, a lot of it was that John and I and, and Brandon Kearney, we were all working at this um, chemical factory in San Francisco. And we would, you know, a lot of the day was spent taking, you know, a gallon jug of uh, hydrochloric acid or uh, uh, ammonia, hydrofluoric acid, whatever, and then decanting it down into little one ounce bottles, you know, and um, really nasty stuff, you know. If you get a drop of hydrofluoric acid on your skin, it will eat all the way through to the bone oh. before it stops traveling. And, you know, and the fumes from these things are, are real awful too. So um, <clears throat> anyway, that's where, that, was our, that was where we were, 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. you know? And um, something about that atmosphere really, it created a lot of, uh, I guess you'd call them in jokes, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a certain, weird mythology that was built up around our horrible jobs and, and the kind of conversations we would have. And we would do things like listen to, uh, you know, loops that we'd made on, on eight track tapes and just have it playing for hours. Or, uh, you know, we got into this thing where we had the Roger Daltrey uh, solo catalog <laughs> playing at the office for days and days. Just like as a just, experiment in self-torture? Just, just torture. It's just like, how could <laughs> like it be worse? Like, this is bad. Let's make it how worse. How anything be worse, you know? <laughs> and um, anyway, there was a lot of bad stuff that went on there. But uh, I, I think that the initial Amarillo stuff was really a reaction to the, this job, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, you throw in a pinch of um, vanity pressing interest and... Um, uh, sort of a hatred for the uh, a lot of the bands that were around San Francisco at yeah. the time. And oh, there was so much hatred. So much hatred. There was so much hatred. And then, and like, the bad relationships that everybody yeah. seemed to be in at the time. And just this overall misery, you know. And rather than wallowing in it, uh, it seemed like it was easier to uh, turn it into something else. There was basically just... vomit it all out well, uh, onto the record-buying public with this this type of record that, as we made it, we knew that it was a completely unique record and that the, the first reaction anyone would have to it would be, why, why is this pressed? I don't, like, this is not, doesn't sound like a record. It doesn't That's have exactly any of what the I thought. components of a real <laughs> record, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, it's genuine. It's, it's the baffling. weirdest thing. It is it's baffling, not, It's not that it's bad. It's just hard to fathom why it was pressed, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, too, records, uh, you know, it, was, it still felt like kind of a weird big thing to have a record it is a, it, and this was just something like in BAM which was this horrible rock uh, music magazine in San Francisco at the time 
one day there was a full page ad from a record pressing plant actually right here in Burbank, just a few blocks from here, Alshire Records, who had uh, been the label that put out the 101 Strings Orchestra. Mm -hmm. But they were also operating as a pressing plant and um, they had an ad for uh, a deal on uh, record pressing and it was as simple as like, this is really cheap. And, but there was a deadline, you know, it was like the mm -hmm. tapes have to be in by this day. It was a sale. And it was just like, let's see if we can, see if we can get something together quickly mm -hmm. and take advantage of this incredibly cheap sale, mm -hmm. you know. And had you guys done a, a live Zip Code Rapist show at that point? We or, had done. Or did you create it for the sale? No, we had, um, we had this band called The Easy Goings that was a four piece that was also weird. Yeah. But um, John and I sort of pared it down to just the two of us. Uh, just guitar and vocal because it was easy to just do things on the run as the ins as the inspiration might hit you know mm -hmm. and so we've done some shows i mean the name was off this list that we wrote at the chemical yes. factory one day we just like made this list of band names i've seen that and list. then we just kind of like went through and tried to form as many of these as actual <laughs> bands as we could and you know zip code rapist was one of them fax ted was on the list there are all kinds of things on the list colonel truth and the berkeley street gurus which we did one show as, which, uh, which is like a horrible hippie. A nice sticker of it right hippie here. Hippie band. I've heard live recordings of them. They're quite, quite a ghastly. good band. Nudity. It's ghastly. Yeah, there's a song called Nudity. I mean, it's very, uh, you now, know, bongos and, and pe men in dresses and just awful. I don't we, think we have a caller me. calling on the phone right now. Oh, man, what next? Hello, Mr. Frederick Michael St. Jude. How are you? How you doing, my bud? I'm just calling to <coughs> congratulate Mr. Uh, Irkington. Oh, man, Freddie, that means a lot coming from you. I wish you were here with us. He is He is oh. here with us. Look, Fred, uh, you can't see it, but I'm holding your album up right now. <laughs> and that's an original. And that is an original. Uh, Fred, what's going on, man? Not much, man. I'm sitting here freezing my us off. Is it cold in Florida today? Yeah, it was down to like 51, 52, somewhere in there, and we oh, wow. Koreans cannot stand it. So we have Frederick Michael St. Jude on the line right now, everyone. This is, uh, this is a guy that Greg was a huge fan of. I mean, was. I still am. Well, a still huge. am, but, but you, I'll you, never you stop found loving. him. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, get, I don't know. Yeah. No, th this I definitely record, got into it. This is something that I wanted to talk about with you on the show. Was like you, you've always kind of gone out and, and like looked for like unusual. We used to listen to this record at, at the Chemical Factory all the time. We found this record, uh, I think, at Amoeba or something. But uh, okay. we got pretty obsessed with it. It's such a fantastic it's an record. There's record. nothing else like it. There's never been a record that sounded anything like this record. It's it's terrific. So, you know, it took. Uh, 15 years or 20 years or something from finding the record to actually find Fred, but right. thank goodness we did. Right. Well, I thank you very much, sir, for doing that because if it wasn't for you, that music wouldn't be available, I would say. Yeah, not available. It wouldn't be in existence, I guess. It's right. tough to find those original pressings, and now, thanks to uh, Drag City Records, uh, both That's this right. album and also... Uh, Fred's previously unreleased uh, rock opera Gang War are both in print, and I cannot recommend them enough. Amazing albums. Get these Amazing records. records. I mean, you can do it right now. You don't have to uh, wait until the show is over. You open up another window on your computer and just order these things. Amazon.com. They're available. FM the St. Jude, Gang <laughs> War. <laughs> Greg, it's fabulous, man. I am so impressed with what you've done. Thank you, man. I, I was wondering, because I don't know the geography of Florida, but our, our film uh, entertainment's playing in Lake Worth, Florida this week. Is that, uh, where is that? Do you know where that is? I mean, I could look yeah, it up. Yeah, that's, that's Palm Beach, basically. Oh, yeah, that's far away. That's far yeah. away. Oh, oh well. don't worry. I'll get to see it. I'll, I'll caravan somewhere. Well, it's on iTunes. I mean, you know, I don't want to turn this whole show into an ad, <laughs> obviously, because I've put tape over this, uh, <laughs> this drink I'm drinking, so... But, Listen, uh, man, if you don't toot your horn, nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah, that's the truth. That's what the people at Pringles Potato Chips figured out, and <laughs> that's why they've had a successful brand. Well, Fred, you thanks for I, thanks for calling, man. Um, I'm I'm going to try problem. and keep this show moving because we have so much to cover. But uh, I will talk to you soon, okay? Okay, both of you. God bless, man.
Take care, Fred. Okay, Take care. Bye bye, Fred. Bye. And let's go over to uh, we have Michael Leahy on the on the FaceTime. How you doing, Mike? Hey, great. How you guys doing? We're doing good, man. Hey, we're, Mike. We're here with Greg hey. Turkington. The gang's all here. It's just like old times. You guys look great. Great haircuts all around. Yeah, you yeah, too, man. Too. Thanks. Yeah, I guess we do have pretty conservative hair compared to usual. Pretty conservative people compared to the usual type of people. What's going on, Mike? Hey, I, I got a quick question. I've always wanted to hear a little more about um, Greg's affiliation with Anton LaVey, the uh, founder of the Satanic Church. Mike, that is a fair question because Greg put out on Amarillo Records a few Anton LaVey releases. So, yeah, that's, that's actually wasn't even on my list of questions. So perfect. That's a legitimate question. Yeah, um, I had this record label and my friend Becky Wilson, uh, she was writing for this magazine, The Nose, and... and uh, ended up over at the Black House, the infamous Black House over on California uh, in San Francisco where Anton LaVey lived. She was doing an article or a photo shoot or something for the nose. And he, uh, he had these uh, keyboards in his kitchen and gave her an impromptu concert and uh, expressed that he would love to make a record sometime. And she said, you got to meet my friend Greg. He's got a record label. And the next thing you know, I get this uh, invitation where I'm summoned over to the black house late at night one night to meet <laughs> Dr. LaVey for myself. And, um, you know, you go into this weird parlor. It's very much like the haunted house at, at Disneyland, quite honestly, the way it was laid out. And you'd sit in this parlor for half an hour before he makes his grand entrance. You know, they're definitely trying to make guests feel a little bit uneasy, I think. And, uh, and then he comes out dressed all in, you know, a black cloak and, uh, and we started chatting and, uh, you know, the fact was we really hit it off on all these different things we were interested in, whether it was, uh, you know, old movies like Freaks or else yeah. um, uh, SCTV. He was really into SCTV. <laughs> I would go over there in, on future trips and we'd watch episodes of SCTV on his TV in that parlor room, you know. Wow. But um, so we hit it off and then he... Uh, you know, he said he wanted to make a record, and I said, let me put out a single for you, and if you're happy with it, then maybe we can do something more. And so he gave me all these cassette tapes that he'd recorded in his kitchen of all these songs, and I picked a couple that I thought were particularly evocative. Um, both of them featured him doing vocals, and uh, we put it out as a blue vinyl 7-inch, limited edition of 1,000. I thought a, a blue vinyl was classier than the predictable red vinyl that you'd expect for an anti <laughs> day. You know, I thought blue was cool, and he was into that too. And, uh, you know, we sold him right away, brought him over some money, and he said, let's do some more. So then it was just a question of me going over there and recording him in his kitchen, playing more songs, and then just sifting through all these four-track cassette masters that he had of stuff that he'd recorded and just trying to yeah. assemble the best records that, that we could do. And then in the meantime, you know, I would go over there and just hang out with him, and it was like the coolest uh, grandfather that you never had, you know, because he had been interested in all this weird marginal uh, art from, you know, way back when. And, you know, you'd be talking about some, some old movie or something, and he'd disappear into the basement and come out with an original press book for it or some other souvenir because, you know, he'd been collecting all this stuff Man, that uh, sounds since like our, the beginning. That's our kind so. of guy. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, cool. Just a really cool. sweet, sweet, genuine guy, you know? So yeah. uh, there you go. Fascinating. Yeah. Man, man, thanks for calling. This is, uh, now, since we're all just coming clean here, you know, Greg's coming clean, I'm coming clean. This, this, you know Clownvis Presley, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. This is Clownvis uh, Presley, right? Since everyone's coming clean. Since everyone's coming clean? I, it feels good to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got Clownvis on the line. Oh. Uh, Mike, thanks for calling, man. That, is a, that was a wicked question, and it fits right into my whole Amarillo thing. Yeah, I love the show. Good to, good to see you guys. Right on. Thanks, good Mike. Good to see you. Come visit us. I know you will. So time, is, soon. time is flying, so I want to throw back to this faxed head record on Amarillo. Mike, can you please play uh, the Faxed Head video clip, which will prove once and for all that some of the craziest metal music ever made will come from people who don't necessarily care about metal. People who don't like metal, like myself. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, faxed head. Um, when I got these records, I went completely crazy. Because unlike you, I did like metal. But uh, this was like a new kind of, it was like... Desk metal. Desk metal. It was kind of lo-fi, the first record was anyway. And I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them. And that one has a secret hidden message. Did oh you my God, the, the, the lock groove? Are you kidding? Okay, so this record here is uh, it's, it's a faxed head single. And I put it on and probably after the fifth or sixth listen, all of a sudden, this voice comes screaming over the speaker that I'd never heard before, like loud, like mix so loud. If you do not destroy this record and purchase another, you will perish. And I was like, I thought the record fucking player was possessed or something. It's just crazy. So it's a locked groove, right? It's it was, a locked groove. So it's like there's two versions of the song. It's insane. I had never heard such a thing and, before. And it's like set up so you would only hear the secret message one out of ten times that you play the record. With the idea being that people would get used to the record. Yes. And then one day, this voice comes in over the record and scares the hell out of it them. It did. And then they try to hear it again, and they put the needle back down. <laughs> it was gone. And the voice is gone. <laughs> it, was so, it was insane. <laughs> Fuck. I mean, it was like the, the joke there that you intended, like, it, it hit its mark with me. Because I listened to it many times, and then all, the, and th all of a sudden, this voice comes screaming. I mean, this is, a, this is the kind of treat that you cannot download. <laughs> Even if you got the voice the first time you heard it, then you might not ever hear it again. Right. You know? Yeah. No, it's completely bizarre. And it's not mentioned anywhere. So yeah, that and was the kind of shit we were into doing. There, there's just a there's a whole bunch of faxed head singles that I mean they were all really fun and really interesting and the lyrics were so hilarious. I mean, when like like I said, this is the first thing I ever bought that you were on. And I, I get to the lyrics. Uh, In my little town, you'll meet Bobo Walker's Got No Feet. Smack in Spanish rice. Shoot them up, they're both nice. Now to me... It's a portrait of small town Americana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just so fucking glad I found that record. And then, I mean, my God, it just, it doesn't end. I mean, there's so much stuff here. Like, I, I we'll never get to all of it. Oh, Ugh. now, well, yeah, because the next 20 minutes of the show are gonna be mopping up Sammy <laughs> Hagar's rum. <laughs> Um, I want to. I want to also bring up. Uh, so this is the first Neil Hamburger single. That's where it all began. Yep. Now that was. I bought this simply because it was an Amarillo record, and I put this on, and I went absolutely crazy because again, it was another one of these. Why is this on a record? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, it was just this cr character that I didn't know, but that you created and. Rec so you, can you talk about this single? Well, you know, on the one side is the, the live show of this non-existent comedian at the time, Neil Hamburger. Then on the other side of the record is an interview with a journalist, a radio personality. Ryan Kerr. Ryan Kerr, uh, discussing the making of the record that you're already listening to. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> and it's, it has, this is so funny. Did you do Ryan Kerr's voice too? I did, yeah. Okay. Which oh was just like the God. worst kind of like British slash Australian. <laughs> Accent really poorly done, but then I did it on a four-track cassette recorder, and I just sped it up slightly, so it's kind of yeah. high-pitched, and he's really just sucking up to to the Neil Hamburger character on the thing. Yeah, just, yeah. just really, oh Neil, oh, you're so oh, funny. Neil, oh. <laughs> I mean, I this is a terrible, terrible interviewer, but it's just like it's a it's like a radio special in the making of this record, except that it is the record it's on the record. I know <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So and then you know the the, the actual hamburger side is just a 
faked live show where you know we're using uh, laugh tracks off an Andrew Dice Clay record and cutting them off prematurely and, yeah. and none of the they're not even any jokes they're just fragments of jokes or what sound sound like they could be jokes right. but they actually don't go anywhere I mean they're they're just non sequiturs and and uh, it's incoherent it, fragments yeah, but with bombastic bizarre. laughter yeah, and yeah. applause <laughs> it was so weird it is a weird one and then there's like a fictitious tour schedule on the back that we put out there yeah. yeah i mean this record i pressed those things up again i'm working at this chemical factory and not ever into uh buying much of anything so i would just take my salary and print up records and that in that case you know Back when records were very cheap to print at the time, I printed up, you know, 500 of those Neil Hamburger records and would just uh, leave them in thrift stores, just kind of daydreaming about what would happen when somebody stumbled upon one and put the needle on it at home and said, what the fuck is this? This right. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And that's what I wanted. Well, I bought it in a real record store and I still had the same reaction that you intended. <laughs> So you didn't pay ten cents for it. You, you paid, no, I uh, paid. I paid you know full five dollars or whatever. Five dollars Canadian, which at the time it was just so was fun worth, back then. Uh, I mean, four seventy two U S. If my calculations. All of these are Amarillo correct. records, really. I mean, they all came out so quickly, and I mean, you also did like you just put out records that were always just so weird. Yeah, the totem pole of losers, Amarillo Supergroup. Yeah, it's. Just, I don't know, these things were coming out left, right, and center. It was super fun. It was an amazing time. And of course, I have to show this, this thing. And I'm showing it on cassette because I'm just being a dick, bragging that I have it. Great phone calls. Probably, probably one of the things that you're most known for, right, from then? That's still the biggest selling record I've ever, I've ever done. Um, now, the story with this is, I know it's well documented, but... Yeah, um... Uh, Myself and some friends were getting into this late night prank call, prank call party. You know, you're talking about five or six people up in my attic uh, apartment, and we would just get together at night and make prank calls for the fun of it. And then eventually, um, uh, Becky Wilson again. She uh, she asked if she could record some of the calls. She recorded them for a couple of nights. Started passing the tapes around, and before you know it, it's like people all over the world seem to have these tapes. So, uh, you know. What, what is there to do next but press it up as a record and a cassette and a CD and uh, put it out there. And the timing was great because it was right when the whole Jerky Boys thing started and it actually was a good time for, for prank calls. Mm -hmm. And of course before Star 69 and all these TV shows and uh, wariness settled in with the public so that now you know, people hang up on you real fast oh, yeah. if, if you make a phone call and it's, it's not straight ahead instantly. No, it's it's a dead scene. Look at this. Let let's go to FaceTime here. We got uh, JP That's on the line. That's a familiar face. There's a familiar face. How you There's doing, JP? Hey, buddy. Hey guys, how are ya? <laughs> We're all right. Hey. How are you? Hey, Jeepers. Good. I just wanted to say, great show. I love you both very much. Oh well, oh, thank man. you. Why don't you come on down here? We're <laughs> drinking this unnamed. Uh, we can't name it due to lawsuits. Drink and uh, just having the time of our lives. Oh, well, I know that brand really well. You can't hide it from me, Greg. Oh, come on. Come, come on. on. Don't Greg. kid with me, man. This is serious. Hey, man. No joking here. And J Denise says hello. Japers, hey, I love your white cat, Denise. Denise is so cool. She's a real sweet cat, for real. Yeah, have, a, have, a, have fun. I'm loving every all the old footage. Oh, yeah. Well, there's no more of it, so I hope you liked it while it lasted. So tune out. Well, yeah. then I'll fucking turn it off now. Now you, saw, now, now you know what I did all weekend when I wasn't with you. There you go. All right, see you guys. Bye. See ya. So, I don't know. You better go through all those records quick. We're Just jumping. Flash them all. We're jumping through. Remember when Annabella was on the show and I had my Bow Wow Wow collection it's, like this? Isn't like, it couldn't, crazy? Couldn't get through the records quick. I know. I, so many. There's just so much. Stories. Oh, rap. Okay. Ugh. Crap. Speaking of, speaking of prank phone calls, let's talk about this this very uh, seldom seen record, "Tell a Fuck You" by Greg Turkington. Is this the only record <laughs> that has your name, like Greg Turkington? I think that or the Golden the Golden oh, Institute yeah. uh, Final Relaxation, the Hypnosis record I did might have my name on the. There's cover. all kinds of Golden Institute records here. These are the Golden Institute. Yeah. I mean, my God! Look, I mean, again, 
I heard these records. I'm like, why is this on a record? But why would the sounds of the international airport restrooms be on a record? Why would you ask that? This is something that people always <laughs> wanted to hear. And, it, you know, you had to actually travel to these places to hear these international <laughs> airport restroom sounds until we put this record out there in the marketplace so that uh, you were able to listen to these things in the privacy and comfort of your own home. <laughs> Oh my God! The, yeah, the, the, okay. Is all that these, on yellow vinyl? I think it is. Uh, this one, this one, one, the or is it on brown vinyl? This one's on black vinyl. Oh, but the San Francisco Adult Bookstore is on. Uh, oh, that's on semen vinyl. Semen colored. <laughs> yeah, we did this record, and it comes with a tissue. It, it comes. No, it does come with a <laughs> tissue. And the restrooms one comes with a, a fold-up um, toilet seat cover. Yeah, it, it's in, in there. there. I've got it. I've got it all. There's just so much to get And through. that's on French fried vinyl. That sounds of the American fast food restaurants. <sighs> I mean, this is a very important series in terms right. of documenting these sounds that would otherwise be lost. This pile of records is overwhelming me. How You must have brought all these from Canada, huh? I brought a lot of my collection from Canada. There's still tons of stuff up there. You left Canada. all the metal there, I hope. All the Alice Cooper shit. <laughs> no, I, I, I rebought that all down here. Oh, man. Alice Cooper's not metal, you ding dong. He is Come shit, on. though. <laughs> <laughs> His <sighs> stupid band thinks that they're metal, though, the way that those idiots dress. Well, the new bands, I mean, I mean the guys that he doesn't know, just these young guys that are just ready to go. Just 12-year-old fucking kids. <laughs> <laughs> with like three blow dryers on their heads before they walk out on stage to play at metal fests. This Alice Cooper isn't metal. Oh, really? Because look at his schedule. Look who he's playing with. You know what's funny? Ask him what it is. Remember, Ask him what that music just is. Just last year, we bought that like Alice Cooper live. It was oh in like 1990 like or something. Mount Vernon, Washington. Oh, it was. It was just horrible. horrible. <laughs> Ruined the whole trip. I mean, it's it so much fun on tour, you know, Mike and I. We listen to all kinds of crazy things and have the funniest, wackiest conversations. <laughs> Unlike it all now. came to a standstill when we bought the Best of Alice Cooper live from 1990. God, that was... Put it in the uh, fucking car. <laughs> Jesus and I mean, that, Christ, that was man. so long ago. Can you imagine how much worse it might be? I know. Be it already <laughs> sounded like he was in his 80s. <laughs> But I mean, he sounded like he was in his 80s in the 70s. Well, it's not, he wasn't the problem. It's, it's the he band. He is, well. No. A bad carpenter blames his tools. I, I like Alex Cooper. He's, well, he's, you're, we have to agree to disagree. Well, it's not the only he's thing. He's an old just, fool. He's, he's an old <laughs> born again, golf playing, Gerald Ford worshiping buffoon who has like 10 seconds of good music in his whole catalog. <laughs> <laughs> and all his fans apologize. Well, I mean, that record's not good. Well, no, that one isn't good. Well, no, you're right. That's not a good record. Yeah, no, the show's pretty bad. The live show is bad. You're right. <laughs> well, no, he's actually a dullard. But, you know, like, well, there's nothing left, man. You've just gone through everything about him. He's awful. No, he's Why got, are we like, talking about him? He's got, like, you got to get him on Webovision. I want to himself. have him on Webovision. He's got a few good records. But he's too busy 70s. doing the PTL club. He's not going to come on your show. Okay, we got a phone caller here. Let's waste some time with this. Hello, caller. Uh, hello, my Vicky. Hi, who's this calling? Um, I'm always on your Periscope with future LPC7. Oh, yeah? Do you have a question for Greg Turkington? Or for Alice Cooper? Cooper. Um, I actually, it's a kind of from the chat room. Everybody's very concerned about the fact that Greg has been sitting on his leg for the entire show. Uh, yeah, I'm it's trying to, I'm trying for it to go numb. <laughs> Because this show's ratings are so poor that if I can get my leg completely numb, I'm going to saw it off <laughs> on the air. But it will hurt too much if it's not numb. So we have to... You, that's what you guys are talking about? We're talking Alice Cooper. We're talking totem pole of losers. All right, I will stop sitting on my leg. Jesus Christ. I'm going to lean on this other... This, this is a terrible couch. Tom used to have these really nice chairs here that Ed McMahon had sat on really nice chairs and they switched to this couch, which is, I'm sorry, but if you do get Alice Cooper on the show, he's not gonna wanna sit on this. It's not comfortable. <laughs> Especially for a man of his vintage. I mean, sitting on your own leg is preferable to sitting on a cushion. That's, that tells you there's something wrong with this couch. <laughs> we're just 
worried about when you get up that you're not going to be able to walk. What makes you think oh. I'm going to get up or that I can walk? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent answer. Excellent answer. And that's an excellent comment. Thank you for calling. I wouldn't call it an excellent comment. I'd say she's missing the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of, uh, I mean, these records, they're... There's a billion of them. It's, it's very overwhelming for me to see them all at once, especially with the guy behind it all right here. And how about your own record that came out on, the, on my very label? Yeah. Why don't we talk we about that? Why don't, you, why don't we get a close-up of that? All these Amarillo records, you know, that, that I was so proud of. And then I ended the label back in 1999 to concentrate on other things. But we reactivated it 15 years later to put out Mike's single because we believed in the song so strongly and went to the exact same pressing plant, the same old timer in Nashville. Same. That printed this cheap, thin Isn't paper that cover. We, I tracked him down and he printed my Same Mike's exact cover. thing. And, and see, my cover's a little, a little uh, tip of the hat to, to yours. I don't know. No, it's, it's a great record. I, I believe in it. Well, thanks for putting it out, man. Yeah, well, somebody had to. Somebody had to. Wow. All right, so you, uh, as Neil Hamburger, you know, we're, we're here in Tom Green's studio. We're, we're live on Tom Green's Webovision. And, as uh, as a Disneyland once claimed to be the happiest place on earth, but my experience being on the, well, not this couch, but on the other couches here, this is the happiest place on earth. Now, as Neil Hamburger, you hosted a little show. I did. Uh, the original channel One called Poolside Chats. One of the proudest Chats. Things I've ever been involved with was poolside chats. Well, let's let's have Thanks a little to, look. Uh, executive producer and creator Tom Green. Let's have a look. Let's Mike not. and Bill Cosby. He's out of his mind. Who is this? Uh, it's Keith and Victoria and Tempest Bledsoe and Malcolm Jamal Warner. I thought you had to have a license to operate a phone. Yeah. Take 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 the hat off your head, Richard D. James. Yeah, take the gun out of your uh, drawer and put Ass. it to your head out and blow your, your brains out, you <laughs> cocksucker. <laughs> is this even on? What is this? This is a nightmare. So after years of not watching it, I watched that complete episode last night at like one in the morning, you know, in preparation for this, and I was dying at how funny that was. I've still never watched no, Poolside Chats. It is, it is so But it sure was good. fun to do. It was, I mean, it's just so freewheeling, you know? And it is freewheeling. Yeah. Not, it's, not it's, like this scripted no, no, this thing is, we're doing here. Well, I don't know. Uh, that was just, la like, that one especially because there was doubts that it was even streaming on the air. And oh, I know. I was, you and I Buzz Osborne. I started talking out of character because I, right. I was told this isn't airing. Which actually added to almost the fascination of it because it's like you can sort of see the cracks, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was... I loved poolside chats, man. And also, speaking of our, our leader, Tom, hey, Mike, why don't we bring up that shot? Do, do you remember this? Look, there, there's a young Neil Hamburger and a young Tom Green at uh, Barrymore's in Ottawa, Ontario. Oh, my God, yeah, we did that show together back in, well, when was that? Maybe 10 years ago. At least 10 years ago. So we weren't really young. Well, okay, younger. <laughs> younger <laughs> but anyways i just wanted to that was a fun night that was a fun night they're, it's always fun in ottawa fun nights you and tom you guys are from a cool town i'm sorry but you think? I, I always have a good time in ottawa he thinks so too no it's uh, ottawa's cool yeah I, of course it's, you have a good time in ottawa you go in you get paid a lot of money and then you oh leave yeah i've gotten good. paid a lot at some of those shows in ottawa <laughs> Jeez. yeah barely enough to fucking cover the cost of getting there <laughs> no but it's always fun there i don't know there's something about it yeah you know, you know what's weird is like uh Canberra, Australia. I mean, I do a lot of tours in Australia. I've done 15, 16 tours, and Canberra has a similar reputation to Ottawa as being this boring home of dullards, you know? And um, I never have a good time in Canberra, honestly. Mm. I love it over there, but that town actually does kind of live up to uh, the negativity. Oh, really? Whereas Ottawa is the opposite. Well, we I always do, have we a great a time, time, but maybe yeah. that's just because you're there taking me around and showing me all the haunts. Yeah. Right? That's where this that's happened. That's gotta be it. And that's where that happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of ugly. That's where I dropped 50 cents and looked around for it for an hour and couldn't find it back in <laughs> 1987. Exactly. Those are the kind of details that, that we bond I'm over, I'm interested though. in those, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you told me a story about dropping a, a dime somewhere, and I, I, you know, I thought about it I and went home it's... and went on Google Maps and tried to find the dime, yeah. you know? <laughs> so right here, I've got the soundtrack to uh, the new... Film Entertainment, starring Greg Turkington as and the Mike comedian. Hickey as the heckler. <laughs> 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 uh, 
so this this soundtrack is actually you know pretty amazing, and uh, we've got Leah Devora on it, who is also sat on the couch. Webovision veteran. A Webovision veteran, and it's got Frank Sinatra Jr. on here. My personal idol. Which is something I wanted to ask you about. Now, uh, you're on record as as saying that Frank Sinatra Jr. is like an influence on the Neil Hamburger character, and could you? Uh, fill me in on that a little bit because I, I you and I have never of the millions of things we've talked about I don't know if we've ever talked about Frank's influence on Neil Hamburger. Well you know I, I think he's a really fantastic singer and that there's there's a lot of emotion that goes into every note out of his mouth and it's a heavy heavy sort of vibe because his career has been very difficult you know um, due to all kinds of factors one being that he hates, loathes rock music. And uh, he was a young person in the 60s trying to do basically a, a big band style of music at a time when, uh, you know, you know what it was like in the 60s with all these rock and drug bands, you know. And this is something that he didn't like. Um, and then also comparisons to his father, which I think their styles are very different, but, um, uh, you know, it's just a tough thing when any review of what you're doing is always going to be put in the light of uh, being compared to the greatest singer of all time. Yeah. You know? But anyway, as a result of all these things and others, there's, this, there's a, an interesting ambivalence that, that I find uh, in his stage show, and that's really what's been the influence on me. Um, you know, here's somebody who, on one hand, knows that, that he's, he's great, and on the other hand is kind of, at least what I'm reading from the shows, there's a certain, I uh, wouldn't call it disgust, but almost verging on the disgust, you know. Um, it, it's just an interesting show. It's it's a real mix. It's a it's a real mix of emotions. You've seen him alive a lot of times. I've seen him a lot, and and I I don't I can't say how much I think he's a great 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 vocalist. But you know there, there there's so much going on with that career and trying to make that career work and uh, so many obstacles along the way. And you know when you do a show as great as his show is, and then the first thing out of somebody's mouth after the show is over is oh my god I love your father so much you know yeah it's tough I mean Sean Lennon is going through the same sort of yeah. thing right now you know which is it, it, it's it's heavy you know yeah and so anyway I I would say I mean the Frank Sinatra Jr. live show is nothing like the Neil Hamburger show except that with Neil Hamburger there's definitely an ambivalence that to the to the material itself that I find interesting well the um I mean, <clears throat> I know that it, you're like me in that, like you, you know, you, you're a real fan of things that you're a fan. Yeah. Of. You get excited about things, and I, you, I you sure met am. Frank Sinatra Jr. like last year, right, for the first time. Yeah, I, I um, well, I'd met him at a Frank Sinatra show once, okay. and was trying to talk to him about his music, but was he was being mobbed by people trying to talk to him about his father's music because he was conducting uh, for his father for a while, and I, I went to a couple of those shows, you know. Um, but uh, what was the question? I was just asking um, what it, like, I, I wanted to know what Yeah, it was no, like I met him and I actually asked him if we could um, use the song in, in our movie and, and he was very gracious about letting us use it and then here it is on the soundtrack. I mean, what a dream, right? It was right? in the trailer what to the movie. What a dream! Well, when, when Rick Alverson, the, the director of entertainment, and I first, the first conversations we had about the movie, I mean, within three or four sentences, I said, yeah, that's fine, I'd like to do this movie, but we have to have the song Black Knight by Frank Sinatra Jr. as the theme song because to me this encapsulates, encapsulates the whole Neil Hamburger character in one song and it's very important that this is the theme song, you know? Yeah. And I had been pushing for this all along the way and, um, you know, he did lay it down in the, in the footage to see if he thought it worked and he thought it worked, yeah. so there it is. And actually, I think the single most common uh, Twitter comment that was coming at me when we released that trailer was, "What is that I know. theme music? Everyone online How can went I get crazy. that song? You know, everyone because went crazy. To me, it's like song. one of the great American songs. Frank Jr. wrote it and sings it, and it just was completely unknown. You know, just it didn't get the the due that it deserved. And hopefully, by being on our crummy little soundtrack, hopefully we can rectify that to some yeah. extent. Well, I mean, everyone was asking about. I mean, everyone's going crazy for it, and. They can it's get the it. Best, they you know, can get it on this record, Entertainment. Just uh, Entertainment soundtrack through the Numero Group, which yeah. is 
one of the finest labels in America right now. It's really exciting to uh, and there's only a have thousand. this come out on the label. There's only yeah. a thousand of them, so order order now. And um, Entertainment, the movie. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about like Greg's past and all the insane stuff that he's done over the years. All the shitty <coughs> records that well, I've done over the years. there's more to it than that, but uh, I, I know everyone, like, Entertainment is, is quite, it, and everyone's covering it, but I mean, for, for me to see that movie just like all these years later, just... It's pretty weird, huh? Like, I'm not saying, like, this was never the goal. No. You know what I mean? But I, I tell you, like... You never heard me talking about one day we're going to get a feature movie about this. Never. <laughs> it's, it's just insane. I mean, all the years that I've been sort of following what you've been doing and that, that we've been friends, and it's, it's just always been really interesting, and now... I'm going to see, uh, see Entertainment the movie at a theater here in LA, and I'm, I'm after, after the movie there was a little party and I'm talking to Bob Zmuda, who is Tony Clifton, who played Tony Clifton, and I'm just like, my mind is being blown because I'm talking to Tony Clifton at a Neil Hamburger movie premiere, and then I look over my shoulder and Greg is talking to Marissa Tomei. It was a weird I night. mean, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on? I know, I know. Just because to me, this, this stuff, to me, I, I don't think, I mean, you've been following this shit for over 20 years. I don't think it's that different than it ever was. It's just somehow broken it's through not, on this. No, it's I'm not. still on a small level, but it's broken through more than it had, you know? Well, the, the thing and it's, is, it's and, bizarre. and this is super important to me, is that it's always been like very inspiring to me to see you who has never once ever compromised or pandered. You've never softened, softened things. Like, you've never done anything that you thought, oh, if I do it like this, more people will like it. You just do That's your thing, and people can kind of tune in or, or I tune was on out. CSI. Well, that was as an actor. That was a joke, anyway. Yeah, but yeah, you, he was on CSI. So, basically, anything's possible. From tell a fuck you to CSI. They're kind of similar, in a way. <laughs> Oh my God! Well, anyway, so there's been I, I blew this. There was a thousand things I meant to talk about, but well, we'll talk about it on the next car ride. Okay. Well, uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming here and talking out of character to me oh on boy. camera. Awkward, considering you know we're friends, so it's a little weird trying to have a conversation. It wasn't so weird. No. Okay, it was weird for me. <sighs> well, that shines through on the on the footage, I'm sure. <laughs> How did, how did I compare as a guest compared to uh, like a box of old moldy Ed Wood reviews? Oh, man. Were those I was more pretty, emotive than I was? I was pretty excited about them. <laughs> were they funnier than me? No. No, they weren't funny. They were just weirder. They were rarer. Rarer. Yellower? Rare, rare. Yeah, much yellower. The, the tape. Who seemed in poorer health? The, ta the, the, ta oh, the tape. The tape seemed in the worst health of all. <laughs> Okay, everyone, go watch Entertainment when it plays in your movie. It's playing in Ottawa, Canada, early December. It's uh, available on iTunes right now. Do not download Portland, it. Portland, Seattle. Portland, Seattle. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere. Dallas. Everywhere movies are shown. Winnipeg. It's coming to Winnipeg. Go to magpictures.com slash entertainment. That's Magnolia Pictures' website, magpictures.com slash entertainment for all the uh, screening dates. And, of course, iTunes and Amazon have it. Right now, you can stop watching this and start watching that one second later. Yeah, so watch, uh, watch his movie, or Entertainment. Don't. Or go Rick. fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you everyone, and uh, good night. Do you like what you see? Would you consider supporting me? T-shirts for sale, I've got T-shirts for sale. I've got t-shirts, I've got t-shirts, I've got t-shirts for sale